Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this Brexit Institute webinar on Brexit, COVID-19, and the transition period. Uh, I am Federico Fabrini, uh, the founding director of the Brexit Institute, uh, and I'm delighted to be able to open this event. Uh, so allow me to say just a few introductory words. Uh, first of all, this is the first ever webinar organized by the Brexit Institute, uh, and it's great to see uh, that we have over 200 people signed up uh, and at least 100 now uh, tuning in from across Ireland, Europe and the world uh, to uh, attend this virtual event. Uh, secondly, I think uh, this event, this webinar takes place at an incredibly timely moment uh, on the one hand, uh, this is a crucial month for Brexit as the United Kingdom and the European Union are intensifying negotiation on their future relation uh, and must also make uh, a decision on whether to extend the transition uh, beyond December this year. Uh, but at the same time, on the other hand, while COVID-19 and its health impact uh, is receding, uh, governments in Ireland, the United Kingdom, and the European Union as a whole uh, are intensifying their actions plan uh, to contain the effect uh, of the pandemic on the economy. So I think it is really very appropriate that we discuss the interplay between Brexit, COVID-19, and the transition period. And I'm truly delighted that we have put together an exceptional panel of experts from uh, academia, media, business uh, and the EU institutions. Uh, so as such, uh, let me welcome Shauna Murray from uh, Euronews, uh, who will moderate uh, the debate uh, and introduce uh, the speakers. Uh, but let me also uh, take the opportunity to salute and acknowledge uh, the involvement, uh, first of all, of Stefan de Rink from the European Commission. Uh, he's uh, one of the most senior member of the task force uh, negotiating uh, with the UK. Uh, he's a career official uh, within the EU, but I'm also pleased to say he's an alumnus of uh, my alma mater, the European University Institute, where he uh, did a PhD in, in politics. Uh, moreover, I am really excited that we've managed to bring together representatives uh, from all the core corporate sponsors uh, of the Brexit Institute, starting with uh, Colin Hunt, the CEO of uh, AIB, uh, Mick McAteer, uh, the managing partner of Grant Thornton uh, and Ken McCourt uh, from Arthur Cox. Uh, I really want to thank uh, AIB, Grant Thornton and uh, Arthur Cox for their continued support uh, and trust. And it's great that, they, that you're here today with us. Uh, and finally, I'm also uh, pleased to welcome my colleague, uh, Eduardo Celeste from DCU School of Law and Government, uh, who is our rising star in the field of, of privacy and, and data protection. Uh, so given this stellar composition uh, of the panel and taking into account that webinars are uh, uh, usually more effective if they are shorter, uh, I don't want to take away any extra time. Uh, let me just add as a final point uh, some practical information on, on the technological side. Uh, the uh, audience audio is muted uh, so as to avoid uh, sound interference. Uh, but uh, we have um, enabled a, a chat uh, which allow you to directly raise question uh, going to the moderator. Uh, and also let me say we are recording uh, this event and we hope to make this uh, available later on for people who don't have perhaps uh, a very good uh, internet uh, connection. So once again, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, welcome to the Brexit Institute and I'll hand you over uh, to our moderator, Shauna. Thank you very much, Federico, and welcome to today's uh, discussion and narrowed down to Brexit, COVID and the transition period. Um, I'm Shona Murray. I'm a Brussels-based correspondent for Euronews, but I've been covering Brexit for the past uh, five years, I suppose, since it became a possibility. And I'm sure for the next five, ten years ahead. But um, as uh, Federico said, we've got a great panel lined up for you. Um, I'll just go through them and then we'll obviously hear from Stefan. But first of all, Stefan de Rink, member of the European Commission Negotiating Task Force on EU-UK Relations, has been for some time now. Uh, Dr. Eduardo Celeste, Eduardo is of course a lecturer in law in DCU. We've got Colin Hunt, the CEO of AIB, 
Mick McIntyre, the managing partner for Grant Thornton Ireland, and Kean McCourt, partner and head of the corporate and M and A group at Arthur Cox. So, if we could start uh, with Stefan, first of all, I also just like to say for anyone. Uh, participating and listening you're very welcome if you have any questions if you just put them into the chat but state your name and who the question is directed to and also the organization you're coming from we'll get to as many as, as we possibly can but without further ado Stefan well hi good afternoon thank you Shona and thank you Federico also for the, the nice introduction uh, I've been working for nearly four years Shona on Brexit and I hope it's not another four years to be very honest <laughs> but uh, that's besides the point for her today's presentations. I'm happy to be with you in Dublin. So I couldn't be there physically, of course, with all the travel restrictions and the COVID crisis. Ireland is certainly one of the most affected countries politically and economically by, by Brexit. And in all fairness, on our side, I think we can also say that Ireland has been shown solidarity or has felt the solidarity of the EU throughout its withdrawal negotiations, first with the backstop, then with a more permanent solution that we have negotiated with Johnson's government in the revised protocol. So the title of the, of the conference is on COVID Brexit transition. I will not say so much about COVID, even though that will be an important point going forward. The June European Council will certainly be dominated by the economic recovery instruments that the EU will want to put in place uh, to tackle the, the economic and social fallout of the, of the sanitary crisis, of the virus crisis. And so Brexit is certainly not going to be a central theme at next week's June European Council. Now, the issue of transition is the, is the other issue you referred to in the title. Clearly, the, the question I'm posing myself is, if, is it wise to end the transition at the end of 2020, given the COVID and the economic recovery that, that will be needed? But that's also a, a joint decision that the EU and the UK needs to take. And the UK has been very clear where it stands on, on the issue of transition. We on the EU side remain open to discuss the possible extension of a transition. Uh, but it has to be a joint decision, of course, that both parties need to agree to and need to decide on the duration of such a possible extension and the lump sum that would come with it in terms of the financial contribution that the withdrawal agreement foresees uh, for the UK in case there would be an extension of transition. But if you assume there's no such extension, then clearly the time ahead of us is very short. Uh, if you think about the need for ratification and the internal procedures on both sides, we certainly would need to have a legal text ready by the end of October 2020. Uh, so in four and a half months from now, uh, for, as I saw on the blog of the DCU, one of your contributors called it one of the most complicated agreements in contemporary UK history. So it's quite a tall order to, to use these four and a half months to create that comprehensive partnership that we agreed with uh, Boris Johnson's government in uh, October 19 to, to establish that and with tariff-free, quota-free relationship between us with a close security cooperation between us in the context of an overarching partnership council governance structure within which then the, that partnership can further evolve in the future as our mandate also on the EU side, on the EU side says. Now, if we come to where do we stand on the negotiation rounds, as a first point that I would like to make after four rounds of negotiations, we kind of finished the cycle. We're now in June and June is supposed to be also a month where there will be discussions at the high level to take stock and see what can be done to boost and accelerate the, the, the talks going forward. Of course, there's been some progress and mutual understanding in a number of sectorial issues and a number of chapters that would need to be part of that new overarching agreement that we would like to negotiate. But there also been lack of progress rather, and, and we are certainly disappointed with the result on the EU side from, from these four, first four rounds of negotiations. We've started working in parallel in 11 work streams, trade in goods, services, level playing field, transport, energy, fisheries, governance, security cooperation, mobility, social security coordination, union programs. There's a wide set of issues on which we want to make progress in parallel. So far, what we must conclude is a lack of serious engagement on the UK side on the number of issues that are of core interest for the European Union. One is those standards for open and fair competition, I'll come back to that. One is the issues of fisheries and what kind of sustainable solution we can put in place post withdrawal and post the UK becoming a third country. One is the issue of law enforcement, judicial cooperation and the prerequisites notably for fundamental rights protection and how that should work. 
And one issue is the issue of governance that I already, already referred to. But beyond those four core issues that Michel Barnier has stressed time and again, clearly the UK also is no longer interested to work with us on a framework for foreign and security policy cooperation and defense cooperation. Does not want to discuss anti-money laundering, counter-terrorism financing, although that's part of the political declaration. And the number of issues that we are discussing, like mobility for people, for instance, of course, the UK ambition is quite low because Brexit is about stopping free movement of people and therefore no longer having that regime where EU nationals have that privileged access to, to the UK. I think there are three fundamental points I would like to make on all of that. And the first is that to unblock the negotiations, we really need serious engagement from the UK on the issues I mentioned, especially LPF, fisheries, uh, fundamental rights protection and governance in order to make parallel progress and construct the economic and security partnership that we, that we had agreed to. And one of the key problems in here is a question of principle in my view. And since I'm talking to a law community, uh, the UK basic level playing field for instance says, well, we will not lower standards. We will even go higher. If we change the standards, we're not thinking about lowering them. What we don't want to do though is commit legally to binding obligations in an international agreement, an international law with the EU, because we're basically, that's not where, where we stand. That's also not what Brexit means for us. And of course we respect that the UK has regained its sovereignty, but in, if you want to construct new international law, inevitably you talk about the balance of rights and obligations. And therefore we need to come to a point where we can discuss also with the UK what are the substantive obligations on level playing field that the UK is willing to accept? On state aids, on environmental standards, on social standards, on taxation issues, on climate change issues? What is the domestic enforcement that the UK foresees for that? And what is the dispute settlement in the agreement? And how will we settle disputes and take it forward in case of disagreements between us? So all these issues are in the political declaration they refer to that as common standards and enforcement mechanisms. And it is possible, in my view, given the UK's starting point, not to lower standards, to come to an agreement, but we need to get beyond this political blockage of refusing to engage in legally binding constraints with the EU as a matter of principle, which I think is not very, very helpful in these negotiations. State aid is a particularly thorny issue therein, where the EU mandate is very, very demanding. There's no doubt about that, but it's also because for the EU businesses and for economies that are so close to the UK, the possible distortion of competition due to unfair state dates on one or the other side is simply a fundamental issue. And therefore we will need to have very solid guarantees on those issues. On security cooperation where it blocks is the, the commitment of the political declaration to look at the European Convention of Human Rights and not just to look at it, to respect it and to make sure this domestic effect in UK law and national law in terms of fundamental rights protection, which is the basis on which, together with data protection and privacy of data, on which we can then build that close security cooperation. And those are some of the issues that clearly block us from making progress in, in the current talks. The second issue is an issue where the UK has chosen for the free trade agreement model, by its, we have long said that various models are available, and this is the one that we basically settled on after the whole history with Theresa May of the bespoke and the sui generis agreement where we said, no, but either you're in the single market, you're not in the single market, you're in the customs union, you're not in the customs union, but I'm not gonna construct this kind of hybrid situation that it would be advantageous for the UK and disadvantageous for the EU. Therefore, you need to make a clear choice. And the clear choice was on the UK side and from Boris Johnson, one for a free trade agreement. But then the UK needs to accept the consequences of that. And there are of course negative economic consequences to that. But the UK has built up a very strong position as a member of the single market in services, financial services, business services, legal services, and exports a lot of those and has a surplus in trade in services with the rest of the EU. While leaving the single market and going into a free trade agreement, of course, leaves behind the fundamentals on which that economically advantageous position has been constructed. And therefore, one needs to come to terms with the fact that outside of the single market, you cannot simply reproduce the same economic advantages that you had inside, uh, inside the single market. And from the EU side, we need to look at this as what is in our interest. The UK is an important hub for certification in goods. 
for declaring products con in conformity with EU standards? Well, is it in our interest to continue that? Well, clearly our assessment is it is not. Um, with the rules of origin that the UK is asking, the UK would export tariff-free, quota-free to the EU, but also be free to source components from different elements of the world market. And that idea of the UK being a manufacturing hub for the rest of Europe has been there not just for the last months, but has been there for a couple of years now in terms of us having to resist that and having to make the UK accept that as a consequence of its choice to go for a free trade agreement, the relationship also in the exchanges of goods will not be as fluid, of course, as it is today. And so the UK is not just asking for a bit of Canada, a bit of Mexico, a bit of South Korea, a bit of Japan. It is asking for a lot more. As Michel Barney said in his letter to, to David Frost, there's no automatic entitlement from the UK, uh, for the UK on bits and pieces that the EU has given to various third countries all over the world. Um, so on the one hand, the UK is saying, we're just asking for precedence, so why aren't you giving this to us? And we say, well, there's no automatic entitlement to get precedence. But on the other hand, the UK is also asking for a lot more than precedence in the current economic partnership that, that the way the UK sees it. And so it's important to be aware of that, that, that the rhetoric of the UK, that we're asking for precedence only on the UK side, is actually not, uh, not something that is borne out when you look at the evidence of what the UK is asking in the negotiations. And the final point I would make to that, this comes back to, to square the circle with level playing field, close the circle rather with level playing field, you also need to square the circle there with the UK. But to close the circle with level playing field is the proximity issue. So the precedents have a different meaning for a country that is so close to us and it is integrated in our supply chains compared to what has happened with third countries far away from us. And Canada is thousands of kilometers away from us. The UK is of course very close in terms of Dover, Calais and is very close in terms of the Irish, the Irish proximity to the UK. So we're talking here about an economy that is very integrated with us and also geographically very close and therefore once the UK has decided to leave the single market, leave the standards of the single market, the rulemaking system, the food safety standards, the consumer protection standards, the fair and open competition standards, the, the product standards, we have a totally different situation compared to, to what we talked about before. And I can give you examples of further examples if that's of any interest in terms of what the UK is asking beyond precedent in professional qualifications, in financial services, in free movement for service providers uh, for certain specific conditions. So we cannot allow that kind of cherry picking because that would mean that we, we would endanger the integrity of the single market and the good functioning of the single market. And we would try to downplay a short term adjustment cost of Brexit, but the price to pay would be much higher longer term. And in the context of COVID and the recovery, I think the single market, of course, and the integrity of the single market is a tremendously important asset for the EU to, to have and to hold on to. The third point, and very briefly, is that a point of preparedness. No matter what kind of agreement we can conclude as a free trade agreement, there will be disruptions, I just said. So there will be customs formalities. There will be sanitary phytosanitary requirements for UK products coming into the EU. There will be more, uh, there will be more friction for service providers because of national requirements, because of different regulatory requirements in the EU side. So all of these issues, need to, one needs to be mindful of these uh, going forward that in six and a half months from now, no matter what kind of agreement we strike with the UK, there will be adjustment costs in case there is no extension of transition. And no free trade agreement, no matter how ambitious it is, can, can change that. It's not a dogmatic position from the EU, as Michel Barnier said also yesterday. And the UK sometimes says these are unreasonable demands, well, they're unreasonable if you refuse to accept the consequences of Brexit. And they're unreasonable if you want to put the cost of Brexit on the EU rather than on, on the UK. And it's basically the UK's choice. And, and therefore, we need to protect our interests, protect our greatest achievements, the single market, and protect us so the, limit the economic damage uh, on our side. Two more points, if I may, very quickly, um, Shona, if we were wrapping up. Yep. Um, this may be a tough message. At the same time, if I look at the negotiations, I can see the, uh, we can see the trajectory of compromise. And we have, a bit like in some fairy tale, put out some stones that show you the path to a kind of a compromise at the end of the road. And so 
Within the context of our mandate on the EU side, I believe the negotiation team, and Michel Barnier said this again yesterday, that we have the space to compromise. <clears throat> but in terms of our demands, we can see where that is. And, but it really depends to find that necessary compromise that the UK accepts that there must be a proper balance between rights, benefits on the one hand, obligations, legally binding constraints on the other hand. And I think if we get to the point where, where we indeed see the UK change its approach and become also more realistic in what it can achieve in these negotiations, then I think we can quickly go on that trajectory for a compromise. And we're certainly willing on the EU side to, to walk that trajectory. But inevitably, and that is the core political point also for the June, for any June discussion at a high level, is that we need to stick the political declaration that was agreed in October, that's six, seven months ago. And that's basically the only valid starting point to find those compromise uh, operational text that structures the new partnership between us. A very brief point on the withdrawal agreement, perhaps, and the protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland, before, as a final point, before handing you back the floor. In the negotiation mandate of the EU, it is said that the envisaged partnership for the future is premised on an effective implementation of the withdrawal agreement. So the UK recently on the protocol, specifically Ireland, Northern Ireland, issued a command paper that Michael Gove presented in, in, in Parliament. It could possibly unlock a process, and tomorrow we have a joint committee with Maro Sefcovic, our Vice President, and Michael Gove. But clearly we need a lot more from the UK and we need things a lot quicker as well. A lot more in the sense that we need a lot more operational details on how the protocol will work, not just aspirational statements, that are saying we will fulfill our legal obligations, but the time has certainly come for the UK to explain operationally how it will then translate those legal obligations into operational realities in terms of customs and product standards and checks and, and the rest of it. And the pace also of rolling out those operational details and, and, and actually putting things into place in an actual implementation phase will also need to accelerate because six and a half months is very short uh, it's a very short time to, for the UK actually to put things in place so that the protocol can be fully operational the 1st of January and all the legal obligations can be, can be fully respected. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stefan. A lot there, a lot to unpick over the next hour. Um, brilliant. Um, I'll just hand you over to now to Dr. Eduardo Celeste, who is a lecturer in law in DCU for a couple of minutes, Eduardo, then we'll go to the next panelist. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Shona, for, for your introduction and thanks to the organizer uh, for having me today. So I would like to actually to bring in the discussion uh, the uh, element that uh, Stefan uh, uh, neglected in his presentation uh, that is uh, COVID-19 and trying to understand what is the impact of COVID-19 uh, uh, in uh, the context of uh, Brexit and the transition phase. So starting from the assumption that, that the transition phase will end at the end of the year, and here I completely agree with Stefan when he says that it would not be wise for the UK and for Europe as well to end the transition period at the end of the year. Uh, well, the, the, the round of negotiation that has finished uh, last week has essentially shown that uh, no real progress has been made. And uh, we have to be realistic in the sense that uh, the effect of a no-deal Brexit uh, um, on uh, the trade relationship between uh, the UK and Europe will be uh, really negative. So we are talking about the reintroduction of uh, uh, disadvantageous uh, uh, tariffs, uh, but we're also, as uh, Stefan Alaidat, uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, massive disruptions that could be generated by the, uh, this uh, state of uncertainty uh, generated by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, these two factors, uh, plus the reintroduction of uh, potential delays generated uh, by uh, custom checks uh, could produce a lethal mix uh, that will certainly uh, generate a very negative impact uh, from an economic standpoint. And now what I wanted to say is that I recently read that some economists in the UK uh, are argued that uh, the impact of this pandemic it could somehow decrease uh, the negative consequences uh, on uh, 
the assumption of a no deal Brexit. While I think that a COVID-19 could somehow mitigate maybe or disguise uh, the effect of a no deal Brexit, uh, I'm persuaded that uh, a uh, no deal Brexit, uh, uh, the consequences of, the no, of a no deal Brexit cannot be eliminated uh, uh, completely uh, by the impact of this pandemic. We need a, a deal, uh, it's advantageous for both parties, uh, and I think that uh, what is important to stress is that we need a deal in a timely uh, fashion. So here I completely agree with uh, Stefan. I think that one of the things that we've learned from this pandemic is that uh, uh, our businesses are not ready uh, to uh, face uh, uncertainties. So what we need is to find an agreement well in advance, so well before the end of uh, uh, December, to build resilience in our businesses uh, in a way that can better address uh, uh, with more certainty both the challenges of uh, Brexit on the one end and uh, the potential pandemic on the other end. Thank you, uh, Eduardo. Um, and then, Colin, you're next. If you could just, a couple of minutes from your own perspective at AIB of the impact of Brexit, no deal Brexit, and of course, um, COVID-19. Okay, well, um, let's go. Obviously, we have the majority of our, our business uh, is here in Ireland, but we have a, 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 a balance sheet uh, of about, about 12 percent of our total balance sheet is actually within uh, w within Britain so we have a clear um, interest in the well-being of the British economy and also the well-being of the Irish economy as it relates to the strength of, of, of Britain um, so ideally we wouldn't we would we would like not to find ourselves in this position uh, but we are where we are and uh, with uh, six months to go to the end of the year, it seems that we've got um, one of three uh, possible outcomes, a, an agreed free trade deal, which is limited, a, a no trade deal, a, a hard Brexit, or, or an extension to the transition period. And I think that as we work our way through uh, 2020, it is becoming increasingly likely that we will end up with uh, what is in effect a, a, a hard Brexit. Well, Britain joined this, the, 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 the EEC in, in, in 73 for economic reasons. Uh, and it is leaving in 2020 for political reasons. And while Britain became very, very much uh, a, a driver of economic integration across the community, it never was uh, well disposed towards the topic of political uh, uh, integration. And it was a lack of that disposition, I think, that uh, it has led us to the point where, where a hard Brexit is now an, an, increasing, an increasing possibility. Um, if you go back to the campaign, even the most ardent Brexiteers uh, never sort of suggested that we were going to have a, a, a hard Brexit. Uh, leading campaigners would have said things like, we will be outside the single market, but we will still have access to it. Um, they would also have said things like the Norway option looks like the very, very best option for the UK. Yet, as we edge towards the end of this year, it is becoming, as I said, increasingly likely that we will have, or increasingly possible that we will have a no-deal Brexit. And ironically, COVID actually is playing a role in all this, I think. Uh, like the, the Confederation of British Industry has said that an ambitious deal with the EU will be a cornerstone of the Britain's recovery from the pandemic. And it also said that the stark reality is that businesses are understandably unprepared for a dramatic change in trading relations with our biggest partner in just six months' time. Now, that's a really, really compelling case for uh, the government to move towards an extended period because of COVID. But in fact, I think what's happening because of COVID is it's accelerating the, the dangers of us having a no deal Brexit because the negative economic impact of Brexit will be masked and disguised by the far, far greater negative, immediate negative impact uh, from the COVID-19 crisis and pandemic. So those people of an ideological disposition who are very influential in terms of the UK government's 
uh, approach to negotiation, it appears, are using COVID to almost uh, to, to drive forward towards a no deal outcome. And to borrow a, 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 a marketing phrase here in Ireland, it seems that they're going for a pure, unadulterated Brexit. Uh, it's almost like a laboratory experiment uh, with nothing added. So it's also Brexit with nothing added but time, to borrow that marketing phrase. Um, and that's the source of, of deep regret uh, at a political level, because of course Britain um, has become, w w was certainly for a period uh, between the um, mid 90s to the mid uh, uh, 2010s, was probably our most important partner within the European Union on a number of fronts. Mm. And there was a there were very important political ally uh, of Ireland uh, within the European Union. So politically, we will be somewhat bereft, but economically, it's obviously hugely negative as well, potentially because of the reliance of a large amount of Irish indigenous industry. On the on, on 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 Britain as a key export market, so um, one would have thought logically that COVID was going to cause us all to step back from the brink, but it seems that some people are intent mm. on using it as a reason to rush towards the brink. Okay, thanks, Colin. Michael McAteer. Thanks, Shona. Um, I'm going to check whether Colin has been copying my homework in preparation for today, so I'm going to sound a bit like an echo chamber and some of Colin's points. But look, I think. Brexit and COVID have been a huge crisis that Ireland has had to deal with uh, in recent times. And while there are a number of similarities between them, I think there are also a number of key differences. Um, the Brexit referendum took, back, took place way back in June 2016. And I suppose we've had four years to prepare and plan for that. Well, COVID-19 came out completely out of the blue, no warning, no time to plan and no transition period. So while COVID just happened, Brexit still has a number of unknown variables and also has a number of false dawns, so to speak. I think business has reacted to COVID-19 immediately. They had to. They had no choice but to. Uh, they adapted to the restrictions that were brought in, uh, and now they're adapting to the phasing out of those restrictions. Uh, we can also see businesses are now planning for 2021 and reflecting the ongoing impact that COVID will have on their particular sector. Uh, I think even though COVID-19 has been and will continue to be in the short term more devastating than any predicted financial impact of a hard Brexit, dealing with the COVID crisis has hugely uh, benefited hugely by having clear rules in respect to restrictions, a roadmap that was published quickly, and that allowed businesses to plan and adapt and just get on with it. Uh, I think with Brexit, there's been no firm rules regarding trade, no confirmed dates, and there are still far too many unknowns to allow businesses to plan with confidence. Um, we're now halfway through 2020, halfway through the transition period, uh, and Brexit has taken a backseat back seat to COVID-19 for much of this year. Uh, however, as we seem to be coming out the other side of uh, Brexit now needs to come back and be centre stage. Uh, one concern I would have, though, is that the impact of COVID on the economies of both Ireland and the, UK, and the UK, and this is the Collins point, will mask the financial impact of Brexit and allow the more hardliner Brexiteers in the UK government to use COVID as a cover for more hardline mm -hmm. approach negotiations. Um, thereby, if there's a no-deal Brexit occurs, the financial impact of this decision uh, will be positioned as a consequence of COVID, not of Brexit itself. I think the way the UK government has approached the COVID crisis would heighten these fears as initiative after initiative uh, that they've been uh, presenting has been positioned as being the world best or world leader and winning the war against the virus. This approach would seem to be consistent in the negotiations with the EU side, but that they have to win and, and compromise is perceived as losing. Uh, I think with regard to COVID's effect on the Irish economy, uh, in my opinion, there will be a lead lag factor. If you look back at our last financial crisis period, which commenced in 2008, a lot of firms in Ireland didn't particularly feel the brunt of the recession until 2009, 2010 and beyond. Uh, for example, in the period from 2006 to 2008, the average number of insolvencies were running around 400. In 2008, this increased to 575. But 2009, um, the number doubled to 2000, uh, 1,243, and it continued at this level all the way through to 2014. Um, so while there's no question the Irish economy will be damaged as a result of COVID, and obviously the damage in some areas we're seeing immediately in the hospitality sector and, 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 and transport, um, some businesses really won't feel the effect of either COVID or Brexit until 2021 and beyond. So it's just difficult at this stage to predict what the economy, uh, how, how it will be positioned. I think notwithstanding or belittling the financial damage I just referred to, I think there will be some positives. I think to come out of, that to come out of COVID-19, which will also help businesses deal with Brexit, a deal or no deal. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis could be looked at through two clear lenses. 
COVID-19 magnified an already existing problems in businesses. And it had made people act on those issues and get them resolved. I think number two also, it brought to the fore a latent potential for some businesses. For example, businesses uh, could have facilitated working from home, thereby improving agile working and reduced fixed costs. But the COVID-19 uh, pandemic made them make those changes uh, to their business model. I think the same could be true for Brexit. Exporters in the past were probably over-reliant on the UK market for our goods and didn't push themselves to look beyond other markets into Europe. Breakfast, Brexit is making businesses consider this late, latent potential. So I think there is a possibility that some businesses will experience growth, not in spite of COVID-19 or Brexit, but because of it. Uh, I think traditionally people don't like change and uncertainty. So sometimes the natural position is to seek time to consider all of the implications, what, are, what, really, what human nature is doing is kicking the can down the road. However, again, with COVID-19, we didn't have this luxury. We had no choice, we had to change immediately. I think another clear example of the differences between Brexit and COVID has to do with the say-do gap. Uh, there's been a definite reduction in, Brec in, in Brexit's impact per attitude to fatigue and the length of time it has been going on for. However, but when you look at what happened when people were faced with COVID, the say-do gap was considerably smaller. People had no choice but to follow through on what they said they were going to do and do it immediately. So I think, you know, my final point really is, as we all know, that an economy is hugely impacted by consumer confidence. And I was at a webinar during the week uh, and where a comprehensive survey of, of, of Irish and individuals and how COVID has impacted on them. And I thought what was really interesting was there's a 59% increase in people wanting to spend more time with their family, a 52% who want to maintain or improve their physical health. And there's a decrease of 52% of people wanting to be able to buy premium or luxury goods. However, the results also show that consumer confidence does not appear to be at an all-time low. And the survey showed that there was an increase in 42% in consumers planning to enjoy themselves and live for the moment when the crisis was over. So I think a key question now has to be whether the post-COVID-19 world, will these new priorities remain or will we revert back to the way they were before the crisis? And um, I think in, in saying all that, the, the, we've learned from no COVID-19 that we need clarity, we need rules. And when we get clear direction, businesses can react and plan for them. So the question now is, will we get some clear rules in the, in the following six months or so? Thank you. Thanks, Michael. And Kian McCourt. Thanks, Shona. Um, great, thanks. I'll, I'll keep this brief because uh, uh, <laughs> I think uh, much has been said that I would have focused on. I fully agree with Colin, Michael and, uh, and Eduardo. Uh, I think there's certainly a strain of thought in certainly uh, from the UK, that the COVID-19 is, is an advantage that there's cover there. Um, if any of you ever listened to Chris Johns, who's an Irish Times uh, panel, uh, uh, journalist, he's been making this point for a couple of weeks now <coughs> that um, uh, COVID-19 will mask the impact of, of Brexit, of a hard Brexit. And equally, if there is a, a, a bit of a rebound or the infamous V-shaped recovery, it may not be as high in the UK, but again, it'll be masked by, by uh, COVID. But in terms of what, you know, in terms of the, on the advisory side and, uh, you know, what we see, frankly, businesses, to Michael's point, have been focused on COVID. Brexit is just not on their mind um, because it's been going on so long. It's so abstract in many respects. Um, and uh, COVID-19 is existential. So, mm. you know, to Michael's point, you know, once they see, people see immediately rules, uh, uh, see a roadmap, they've done it. Um, and business have been focused on survival, focused on furloughing uh, employees, keeping things going. I suppose where, I, where I'd have a bit of a concern is that as businesses reopen, a lot of those employees will no longer be furloughed, that actually we're going to see quite significant uh, uh, layoffs, hopefully not, but I think, that, I think that's more likely and Brexit will just make that, make that worse. Um, uh, just stepping back a tiny bit, you know, Brexit has had a, clearly an impact already. If you look at global M&A activity last year, um, it was down 30% in Europe and down 30% in the UK and up 30% in the United States. European companies just didn't invest in Europe and other, and traditionally the US, which would be a big investor, did not invest either, either into the UK or Europe. Instead, everything happened in the United States, which drove things. Um, one, one of the other impacts which maybe we get to it, it, it touches on the concept of level playing field. I think we're going to see, and this is where the UK, I think, and Brussels actually may move in lockstep, we're going to see more state intervention, uh, particularly in terms of protecting 
critical European assets and in same in the UK. Um, as recently as April, the Commission President said, you know, expressed concern that as European companies were undervalued uh, in the current climate, that member states could use all options, uh, as a quote, use all options to protect critical EU companies, including the state as a market participant. The UK has, has taken a similar approach. And there's a, there's a consultation due to issue by the Commission next week, uh, in effect, from the competition law perspective, to apply level playing field. Uh, and the UK is doing something similar from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Um, and what this is really all aimed at is actually Chinese companies. So it is a, you know, it's a very critical time for Europe and the UK in terms of, you know, a, a, a multipolar world, but where you've got the fracture in Western Europe, um, there's a particular, I think, circling of the wagons looking towards the east. Um, and ironically, the level playing field concept is being employed by both London and, and Brussels. I mean, one final point on that, um, obviously, it's about taking back control and Getting, getting rid of faceless bureaucrats and everything else. The UK's competition authority, the CMA, uh, is stated as going to be a much more interventionist and in fact is building up a staff number far greater than DG4, which would be the European Commission's uh, uh, equivalent. So um, they're replacing faceless bureaucrats with many, many more faceless bureaucrats. But the overall point is, I think, post-COVID, post-Brexit, uh, state intervention is, 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 is going to be far greater. Okay, thanks a million for that, Cian. Um, very strong comments there from everyone. I think um, I'm going to just focus on Stefan for the moment because he is, of course, the man at the coalface. So I want to hear some things from him. In particular, one question I wanted to ask you, Stefan, is in relation to the transition period. Um, in the withdrawal agreement, June is the last month for um, the UK to request or for the two sides to decide. Is that set in stone? It, could it happen uh, any time after June if the UK decides to change its mind? No, the withdrawal agreement is, is crystal clear on that. The end of the 1st of July, before the 1st mm -hmm. of July, we need to take a, a single decision, as it's called. So, and a joint decision to the UK. It's just because yeah. often in, you, in the EU, things do get moved around, even though Brussels has said it hasn't, but that is set in stone. Well, it's just based on Article 50, which is basically yeah. a legal basis to discuss something with a withdrawing member state. Now the UK is a third country, so it's no longer relevant under okay. Article 50. So there's no... That, that article has been exhausted, so to say, in legal terms. Okay. Um, there was a strong consensus there from um, the other panellists that there's a real concern that the UK may use COVID as a cover for the economic consequences of a hard Brexit. Is that something you're finding amongst your fellow negotiators, interlocutors in the UK? Is that something you felt from the discussions? Um, I thought it was very interesting that I, as a Brexit professional, focus on Brexit, of course, in my presentation. All the other panel members are more drawn to COVID. And, and of course, the bigger economic impact of COVID is, is, is basically the, the reason for that. I, I can't speak to your question specifically because what I've seen so far is a UK delegation that is negotiating very professionally, very with a constructive tone, as diplomats would say. But in the meantime, we're not constructing all that much together. Uh, so far, so in terms of substance, now where, why that is so is something that the UK would have to have to answer clearly from our side. We feel that the time is a lot more pressing than the, what the pace of negotiations are actually showing so far. Do you feel that the negotiations are uh, very political rather than detailed and legal? Do you feel like it's much more of an ideological event? Well, there is a. Brexit is an ideological project in my view, sure. but also from the UK side, a number of what they call a suite of agreements of legal texts that have been put on the table. So it's a bit of both, I would say. Um, you just mentioned towards the end there that you can see a trajectory where there can be compromise on both sides, in particular on level playing field areas, something that you think that the UK could agree to politically while still maintaining uh, the fact that they've left EU sovereignty intact. Where could you explain a little bit about that? Um, well, let, I would leave it for the negotiations rather in terms of what the space for compromise is. I think the important starting point though, if we are going to go for a compromise, is that we come back on specifically on level playing field to paragraph 77 of the political declaration. And that speaks about common standards, 
So the UK has agreed there to the principle of common standards and the UK also says we're not going to lower the standards. So I said in my introduction, I think that's potentially a propitious basis to, to, to build a compromise on. Uh, it also speaks about the enforcement and, uh, and the dispute settlement that is needed to go along with that. And so in that context, if we are coming back and if we're no longer backtrack and if the UK no longer backtracks on the political declaration, I think the space for compromise is there. On fisheries, you've also seen that both sides have what Michel Barnier called maximalist positions mm -hmm. and basically have shown some readiness to move away from it, but it, it, it's not there yet. And so all of that is very, very hesitant. And uh, we need to see how it unfolds in the next rounds of negotiations. Um, and on fisheries, obviously, because it's a very important issue, Ireland is one of the eight member states that are um, find fisheries incredibly important. Um, again, where can you see some sort of a middle ground? Because, of course, the UK, as Michel Barnier said last Friday, was cleaving to this issue of zonal attachment, whereas the UK, as he said, wants pretty much the status quo. Well, we need the solution that gives stability over time. So it is not subject to annual negotiations, because that would be a recipe for, for nightmare negotiations every year, I would say, uh, and also for uncertainty for the fishing industry uh, on the EU side, no doubt. So we need to move beyond that. We need to move beyond that discussion where the UK says zonal attachment is the only principle that would guide uh, our approach. We need to look at the, the approach that is based on different criteria. It also does justice to what the EU is asking in this particular field. And so I think if we get to some of these issues, then we could perhaps find the, find the, the landing zone, so to say, for the fisheries. But I mean, I suppose the, the question is, is there a willingness to find a landing zone, seeing as there's been four rounds and no development or progress at all? And when you speak to, uh, let's say, members of the UK team, you know, they're quite adamant about their maximalist position that they won't, they, they really want zonal attachment to be the sort of main uh, the place to get to. Well, there is willingness on our side for sure. Okay, not necessarily on the UK side, or well, no? I didn't comment on that. I mean, I okay. have to the UK to to comment okay. on that for, okay. you know, for us here. Yeah. So, um, just to the other panelists, Michael. I mean, one of the things that you had made the point you'd made as well was that the diversification in terms of uh, Ireland may be relying too much on the United Kingdom as a political ally, but also as an export market. Do you see this as some, something of an opportunity now for Ireland? I think, yeah, all crises, there's, there's a great saying, never blow a crisis. Uh, and when, you know, when you're faced with change and change being imposed on you, and again, I think, you know, using the COVID as, as just as an example, when businesses woke up one morning and realized the rules had changed, um, how quick they were able to adapt and pivot and, 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 and change their way of doing something that may have, they have done that way for 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, I think Brexit creates that opportunity. So that it's an opportunity that they may not have thought about, they may not have considered because it was easier and simpler to do business in the established markets that they had. But they are now faced with a scenario where uh, one of our biggest trading partners um, could have significant tariffs. And if you're in a low margin business, uh, of which agricultural products would tend to be in that sector, um, tariffs could make that business and that market uneconomical. Uh, and therefore, you are immediately forced to look at alternatives. Um, but that, 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 and that, and that ultimately, you could take a view that the market moves from being a 50, 60 million uh, consumer market to being really a 350 million market. Uh, so the, the forcement of change actually creates the opportunity to actually to, 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 to grow with the business. Not without its, its problems, but, but that's the opportunity. Colin, is that something you'd agree with? Oh yeah, very strongly. I think that, uh, you know, again, um, th this country tends to perform at its very best when its back is against the wall. And certainly uh, the uh, Britain's impending departure from the European Union is not good news, either, but economically or politically, just to repeat myself. Uh, but it, it does force us to look uh, to a far, far bigger uh, market, which is, of course, the rest of the European Union. Uh, we've had a very, very heavy reliance traditionally, particularly for indigenous Irish industry, uh, on, the, on, on the British uh, uh, marketplace. And uh, the good news is that even uh, like really when, when, when Brexit became a real possibility and a sort of an untidy Brexit became a real possibility, we would have seen more and more of our customers begin to focus on uh, mainland Europe um, as a destination for exports. And certainly there has already been work being done. Um, I very much agree with Keane 
the eye has been off the ball somewhat over the course of the past number of, of weeks, the past three months or so, because of of the of the 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 major danger presented by COVID. Uh, but certainly, work has been done in terms of diversification of markets, and that's been a theme for both policymakers um, and um, and industry groupings. So there is. In the, med in, in the medium term, it may well turn out to have been a significant positive, but near term, it's somewhat challenging. Yeah, we have a question here from Derek Mooney from the Brussels European Employee Relations Group. And he, he was wondering, uh, do the speakers believe that Boris Johnson can't count as a transition extension as to do that would be to acknowledge a value to EU membership and that it, the UK is betting that it's the EU strategy will change with the German presidency of the EU, which obviously we know starts next month. Um, Stefan, I might put that to you, first of all. Uh, so what was the question on Boris Johnson? I'm not entirely so sure. So essentially that the, the, the UK's uh, strategy now is to hope that the German presidency can help to change the EU's uh, position on uh, negotiations, probably in the area of level playing field, that the German presidency can help cobble together um, some sort of an agreement that will be satisfactory to the UK. Well, I think that we need to be realistic about this. The, the 27 member states have given Michel Barnier and the European Commission a mandate. And the compromise will have to be found within that mandate. And so that's what we are going to look for. Uh, so basically, that would be my answer to, to, to that question. We, we are ready to accelerate, certainly work. We are ready to step up the pace. We are, but we need to make progress in parallel. And we need to make progress on each of the issues on its own merit. So fisheries, you need to trash out a compromise. Level playing field, we need to do the same. Security cooperation, we need to do the same. And that needs to happen around the negotiation table between the Commission and the, and the UK. And it will be up to the Commission and the Member States and in the second half of the year under the German presidency and with Charles Michel as well on the European Council to assess that process like we have done in the past. The EU has stressed time and again, that we're not going to change our governance method for Brexit that we have adopted uh, at the very beginning of this process, three years ago now. So that process will continue. There's another question here from Peter Doran um, asking, and I might, I'll put this to Eduardo and Kean as well. Um, is there much discussion on the EU side, first to you, Stefan, uh, regarding the impact of Brexit negotiations on the future prospects of a return to the EU by Northern Ireland? So if there was a reunification uh, of the island, is that something that the EU discusses or is, there, is that part of the discussions at all, he's asking? No, we are discussing the implementation of the protocol and that's basically what has been agreed with the UK. And to Eduardo and Kean, I suppose, Eduardo first, um, how difficult would it be for Northern Ireland to, to just, I suppose, transition back into the EU if there was a reunification poll and the vote in favour of reunification? Yeah, so... What I can say is that uh, for sure, as a Stefan highlighted, probably this question is a bit uh, academic and hypothetical at the moment, but I can mm. provide a very concrete example of what uh, is happening now in the context of COVID-19. Uh, for instance, uh, with the proposal of using a contact tracing uh, app. So there are current uh, discussions, of course, uh, both uh, in the UK, in Northern Ireland, uh, about the introduction and the use uh, by population of uh, contract tracing apps. Uh, and uh, you may understand the difficulties uh, that uh, are now concerning Northern Ireland uh, because, uh, of course, of its uh, position on the island of Ireland, uh, the use of a contact tracing app uh, of the same app that uh, the UK has proposed could pose uh, um, problems of uh, compatibility, integrability with the app that uh, the Republic of Ireland is uh, developing. So you may understand uh, here the significance of this question because uh, uh, the population in Northern Ireland may face the dilemma of uh, which uh, contact tracing app to use uh, and uh, probably it would not be a question related to privacy or fundamental rights but it would probably more a dilemma related to a question of uh, political allegiance. Yeah, and Kian, I know that because I know that Bertie Hearn is joining us uh, today. So, I mean, down the line, do you think, uh, you know, this was what complications would there be ahead if there was a reunification between Ireland, North and South? 
um, yeah. given that Brexit has been so complicated. Yeah, I think all the complications would arise at an Irish political level. I think from a European level, if Ireland wants to reunify, I, I, don't, I think there'll be full support. Um, it's, you know, economically, it's not like moving East Germany into West Germany. Mm. Um, it would be very political and everything from our constitution to flags to symbols. You only have to look at statues the last week. Um, I, that, that's where the challenges would really arise. I think economically, you, 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 you'd get there over time. Um, it would really be, be political. Um, Stefan, one of the things that you said er, earlier was in relation, I think Mr. Um, Mr. Bar Michel Barnier said it yesterday, about the risk to the single market um, of, the, uh, of the UK essentially as a competitor. You know, he said, are we going to risk, uh, take a risk on rules of origin, where the UK is a manufacturing hub for the European Union, uh, that it has goods that it's selling into the EU as British goods, but taken from materials all around the world. Can you just tell, explain a little bit about the implications of this for the EU? If the UK you know, had trade deals with other countries, had materials and goods, and they were sending into the European Union tariff and quota free, just because I think that's a really quite a nub of the argument that's taking place now. Well, the first thing is, I mean, the, that there will be competition between the UK and the EU is, a, is normal. There is competition between the member states. But in the context of the single market, of course, that competition is framed by EU standards and rulemaking. And within the context of the UK-EU going forward, it will have to be framed by the international agreement that we are negotiating. But there will be, of course, competition. And that's, competition as such is not, is not a bad issue. It needs to be framed and needs to be fair. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's the first point to, to be made to that. The second thing is, of course, the UK needs free trade agreements with all countries around the world. It's negotiating with Japan, with the US right now, and that's very legitimate. That, that's part of its newly found trade autonomy, trade policy autonomy that it, that it needs to do that and try to strike preferential trade agreements with countries around the world. What is of concern for the EU is the specific issue of the rules of origin between, uh, if you're going to give to the UK tariff-free access to our market, to make sure that the products that get tariff-free access to the UK, to the EU market from the UK, that are therefore exported by the UK, are actually British quote-unquote products or accumulated with other countries of the EU because we're constructing a free trade agreement between the UK and 27 countries. And therefore the rules of origin we have proposed privilege sourcing within that economic space of the UK plus the EU as part of our future agreement. And so it, your question really goes to the heart of the issue on the rules of origin of the future agreement. Um, Kian, I want to ask you, so just in relation to the withdrawal agreement, and I suppose this, tr this trade border that's being created in the, in, in the Irish Sea, of course, it's not an international border. Mm -hmm. But do you see any, I mean, I suppose not constitutional issues, but what issues do you see in terms of Northern Ireland's position in the UK because of that? Yeah, it's, <clears throat> I mean, it's, it, 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 extremely complicated from what uh, I can see. I mean, one of the one of the things that has happened over the last 20 years, I mean, speaking as a lawyer, there's no trade lawyers really around anymore. Um, so people are having to get back up to speed to understand, to learn these things. And just the, the, the sheer grinding minutiae of, you know, forms and papers. And that, I think, over the medium term, almost certainly is going to have an impact in, in Northern Ireland, particularly, you know, you've got some of the, say, the big UK multiples that set up an operation in the North. A lot of them won't bother going forward um, because it's just going to cost them too much and too, to be too much hassle, just as, a, as, a, as a, an example at a local level. So uh, I think it's almost certain that you'll see a greater economic tying between uh, North and South. Um, and you may see the prospect as well, just given it's, you know, it's a lower cost base to other parts of Ireland that, maybe you know companies from the, from the republic begin to to nearshore certain things in there too so i so i'd see it as a a medium term convergence and uh, dr celeste do you do you see that would you agree i suppose with Keane's assessment that it would end up with probably more conversions north and south of ireland yes i would definitely agree i mean i think that uh, also from a political standpoint i mean that would be the most suitable solution and, uh, and also from a European perspective, I see that, uh, I mean, this is the, the way that, we, that both jurisdictions should pursue in the future. 
Um, Colin, would you see that there's opportunities, therefore, then um, on the island of Ireland to become, uh, I suppose, much stronger as, a un as, an, as an island unit? And then what do you think the political implications might be for that? Well, I, I think that um, Northern Ireland, thanks to the protocol, could find itself in, a, in an enviable position at the end of all this, in that it's still effectively has access to the single market, but you know is is, is no longer a member of the European Union. So it, it could it could set it that there is a strong economic case for the for Northern Ireland in a post Brexit uh, world. So absolutely, I think there, there that there is an opportunity there. It's obviously going to need political stability in the north, um, but I think that uh, the ingredients are there for Northern Ireland to actually prosper on a relative basis as a consequence of its special. Uh, relationship with the European Union post Brexit. I mean, though, at the same time, politicians in the North would argue that GB is their largest and most important market Some economically. Yeah, Some okay, I, for sure, absolutely, the majority. But I mean, so nobody can argue that the UK presently is um, is Northern Ireland's very most distinguished market, shall we say. So, mm -hmm. I mean, how do you see a way out of that that they can actually take advantage? Of being in the single market for goods as part of the protocol. Well, one of the one of the attractions Northern Ireland should have is that its attractions as a location for inward uh, foreign direct investment should be enhanced as a consequence of this. Um, so that's that that's one of the, uh, the obviously the Northern Ireland economy is very very heavily reliant on public exp public spending, but it, it 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 does have an opportunity now, particularly when competing with Great Britain to set out its stall as a very attractive location for uh, FTI investment. Um, and we're going to just say Federico wants to ask a quick question to Stefan. If I may, I, I'm mindful that Stefan will have to leave us uh, very soon, but taking advantage of, of his presence today and following up on the conversation we're having on, on Northern Ireland, I just wanted to uh, take the chance to ask Stefan, uh, what is in your view the main weakness uh, of the British uh, paper uh, put forward by Michael Gove regarding the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol? Uh, what, in your views, are the, the main shortcomings of, of, of that approach and, and what do we need, what would the EU need to see from the UK in terms of implementation of the protocol? Well, we have issued a technical note on our side the end of April. That we have published that on, on the implementation of the protocol. I wouldn't speak about weaknesses of the UK paper. I mean, the UK paper is, is clear that the UK intends to uphold its legal obligations and is therefore somewhat aspirational in nature. Then it starts talking about flexibilities and, and certain issues that we need to look at in terms of customs formalities, customs infrastructure, uh, the way in which sanitary phytosanitary requirements will be checked, both domestic production in Northern Ireland as well as incoming products from GB and, and the rest of the world into Northern Ireland and then the VAT excise duty issue is also an important issue there. And I think that the main point I would make is that anything that is done in Northern Ireland by the UK in the context of the implementation of the protocol needs to be within the boundaries of existing EU law and EU policy. So we're not going to renegotiate, we're not going to create additional flexibilities beyond what exists today in the union's customs code or in the SPS context. Uh, and, and if that is well understood, then I think we can move forward quickly. But that moving forward quickly is clearly an imperative need uh, today. Just on the paper, um, do you feel that progress can be made in time for it to be, for the withdrawal agreement or the protocol to be implemented by the 1st of January? Well, as time is, ticking, as we would say, uh, of course, it becomes more challenging. So it, it is very urgent that we get a, a grip of the operational details that the UK intends to put in place. What sort of operational details in the next, let's say, six weeks or so that you get could persuade you that everything will be in place by the 1st of January? What is required in the next few weeks even? Well, it's the application of the customs codes or customs formalities. It's the application of SPS requirements or the checks on the sanitary phytosanitary requirements. It's the IT system beyond that. It's the way VIT excise duty will be organized. So there's a lot of operational challenges that need that needs answers, basically. And if that wasn't, if that is not in place, 
Could, is there a possibility that if the tr trade border down the Irish Sea isn't ready, that there could end up being a trade border or a border between Northern Ireland and the Irish state in order to protect the single market after the UK leaves at the end of the year? No, but I think we need to focus on the correct implementation of the protocol. And as I said earlier, it's also a, the, the, the future partnership is premised on that effective implementation. And so I think that's what we need to focus on for the next six months is how to implement it correctly rather than speculate on alternative scenarios as, you, as your question seems to do. Well, I suppose, but I mean, if, it, if, there is, if it's not ready by the end of the year and it's, a, it's possible, then is there an alternative as to how but, things would work? But we have, I mean, this is not, nothing of this is new, right? I mean, we've discussed this over, over the time in 2018 with the UK in terms of we have gone through the whole checklist of things that must be done. So what must be done is very, very clear in my view. We can discuss a pragmatic approach. We can discuss flexibilities that the union's customs code allows. All that is possible, but um, there's no surprise in what needs to be done. So let's just focus on that. Do you feel that what was delivered by the UK government in, in a, few, a few weeks ago was enough uh, in terms of them acknowledging that there will be a border down the Irish Sea and there will be checks? Because obviously we heard around Christmas time, Boris Johnson saying that there would be no checks. So at least have they come to a point where they're acknowledging uh, what the protocol, what the implications of the protocol are? Well, certainly there's acknowledging what, what must be done. Yes, that is a very positive element of that paper. But the question now is what will be done? And what is the operational reality behind uh, that commitment to do what must be done? Um, I know that Stefan has to go soon, so I'm going to ask if there's any of the panellists if they'd like to put something to him while they have the opportunity. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Well, good luck to all you guys on the COVID thing, because that's, also, that's more important these days, I think. <laughs> okay, Stefan, thanks very much for taking time to speak to us today. Really appreciate that. Thank you. And good luck with everything this week. Thank you. Have a good end of debate. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Stefan. And I don't know, Shauna, whether you have additional questions from the yes, audience. I think Yes, uh, actually, there's very few coming in from the audience. I was going to ask uh, Eduardo, though, because he was uh, was quite, I wouldn't say fatalistic, but incredibly worrying about um, how he sees COVID and Brexit sort of colliding. And maybe he could just fill us in a little bit on the impact that he sees, the immediate impact of a no-deal Brexit and COVID come January. Yeah, so essentially, I try to, to draw a comparison between the effects uh, of the impact of COVID-19 on businesses and what could happen with an old deal Brexit. And I mean, I think that uh, uh, economists have observed more generally that uh, businesses uh, were not uh, prepared. So some of you rightly observed that, of course, uh, by introducing uh, specific roadmaps, uh, businesses uh, then, uh, I mean, try to cope with this kind of uncertainties. Uh, but it has been also highlighted by other panelists that uncertainty in general is not very good. Mm. So by drawing this parallel, I think that uh, it's crucial, I mean, for businesses both in the UK and the EU to have a clear roadmap of what is happening. And I think that uh, uh, this webinar and the ongoing discussion, the negotiation are showing that, uh, I mean, uh, still a lot of... Uh, a lot of uncertainty still persists, and this is not good at all. So what we need to do is uh, to provide businesses with, uh, uh, I mean, with a clear roadmap of what is happening, with clear dates, uh, with the possibility, the dream, the hope to have a deal at the end of the year, mm -hmm. if not okay. at a very precise date. Um, Kian, just uh, because we've got six or seven minutes left, just one of the points you were making was in, uh, the other day and today was about protectionism and how uh, it looks like the EU is becoming a bit more protectionist because of the threat of uh, you know, overreach from China. Um, but the e it's funny because the EU here in Brussels would like to see themselves as the champions of free trade and the only one championing free trade uh, because of when, when you look at the United States, for example. So do you see that maybe the EU is just protectionist against China or actually is driving protectionism full stop? Yeah, I, th I think it's really a reaction because in the States, you, you've obviously had this trend, uh, which actually started before the current administration. They have something called CFIUS, which in effect, um, you know, looks at certain, originally it would have looked at key assets like energy and ports, etc., but has gradually grown in terms of its list. But even within Europe, as was traditionally, you've had countries like France, 
and Germany would have actually been quite, you know, protectionist. Uh, the UK would have been the least until, um, funny enough, until Cadbury's, until the chocolate company was actually bought. Um, they were happy to sell all the power companies and everything, but when, they, when the chocolate company was bought, um, they started tightening up some of their rules. Um, so I think, I think it's just in the context of a much more assertive Chinese state, which is, and in reality, all their companies are state-owned and backed, that um, advantage isn't taken of depressed valuations of key assets and key companies. Um, so I, I don't think it's I don't think it's being protectionist as, as such. More really um, um, uh, going back to a level playing field that you know companies that have huge state backing don't take advantage of the you know what is a, a different set of rules for Western European or Eastern European countries. And just speaking of level playing field, um, you know, state aid is obviously part of that uh, demands uh, in terms of the EU UK nego negotiations, um, but. You know, since COVID, the EU has completely relaxed pretty much all yeah. state aid rules. I mean, we're looking at Air France and, and uh, Lufthansa, etc. So do you think it's fair that the UK, that the EU is demanding, you know, uh, common standards and state aid, but at the same time, the EU has completely cast aside its state aid positions? Yeah, I think so, because in fairness, everyone's done the same. Um, you know, it, 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 and it tends to happen. It happened in 2008. Now it's much more focused on financial institutions, but generally, you know, when there are, when there are systemic moments, things like competition or state aid get thrown out for a number of months or years. Um, so the UK would have been doing something similar. So, so I think in the, in the broad, broader, longer term context, you know, I think the level playing field is a, is, a, is a fair ask. Yeah, and Michael, on that, um, do you, do you, how do you see this level playing field issue panning out? given that it's such an ideological issue, seeing as you know, the UK say, well, the whole point of Brexit is to regain sovereignty and to ensure that we're not abiding by anyone else's standards except for ourselves. Plus, we're world beating on the stage when it comes to money laundering issues or, or their issues around tax and labour environment. I think that's probably one of the most, uh, and that's where again where politics and businesses start to intermingle and, in, and interwine between each other. I mean, the the level playing field, um, I suppose, has always been open open to interpretation, and there's been a constant pushback over the years, even within the the European Community itself. Um, I I think you know again maybe COVID sets out the the the, the opportunity or the the new rules of engagement in relation to state aid um uh, because it has been open to interpretation and and you know various initiatives that the irish government has, has introduced over the years on, on various forms of investment into companies have fell full of of, of what the speech subsequently deemed to be state aid and um, so maybe there will be a, a an opening up or a more liberal interpretation of state aid taken into the future it probably doesn't bode well for Irish companies because I think traditionally the, the type of company that we have had um, doesn't lend itself towards large scale investment uh, via, via state or, or government. Um, and that will probably cause problems in the, in the wider European market where larger enterprises probably are, are more capable of taking that investment going forward. Um, but certainly it might help smaller enterprises at, at, at a much smaller scale uh, take investment on board. And just a final closing sort of point from you, Colin, you, you mentioned to me you spent a lot of time uh, in the UK. Mm. I mean, how do you see this working out for Britain? The fact that in an increasingly protectionist world, it's leaving the, the most lucrative internal market right on its doorstep at a time when the US, at least under Donald Trump, is uh, pretty much against free trade. Um. As I've said earlier, you know, politics has trumped um, economics and political ideology has proven to be far far stronger than economic logic right the way through the Brexit debate. I do suspect that will change over time. And I think that uh, as, like, if, if we are all right about the benefits of being a member of the single market and the, members of being a, uh, the benefits of being a full member of the European Union, and Britain does that economically underperform over the years ahead, I suspect with the passage of time, a case will be made for Britain to rejoin the European Union once again. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, it'll be joining on far, far different terms uh, to the terms that it, it exited. Like, to be perfectly frank about it, Britain has a, a very, very special bespoke deal. Uh, it's not subject to the social chapter. It obviously has, uh, it doesn't have to be a member mm -hmm. of the single currency. Um, but those things will change. And of course, it has its financial rebate as well. So uh, all that will change when it comes to look, as I suspect it will do, 
uh, but it might take 10, 15, 20 years. All that will change when Britain starts negotiations to re-enter the European Union uh, over the course of the next number of decades. At a personal level, I'm really, really sorry to see Britain leave. They're a very important economic trading partner for us. They've also been a very, very important political ally, uh, really, since the, since the late 1990s. Uh, but I have some maybe excessive optimism that this will be a temporary phenomenon in the long history between these islands. And I suppose just, just finally, I mean, when you were living there, it was never really acknowledged the bespoke, bespoke relationship the UK had with the EU. You know, the, the fact that it, like that, they had lots of opt-outs, uh, rebates. You know, it was really just about how much money they're giving to the EU at the end of the day. That sort of binary thing. One, one of the truly exceptional, one of the truly extraordinary things about this debate has been, like, I lived, it's, I lived in Britain in the in 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 the uh, in the mid nineteen nineties, and at that point, the extreme fringe of the Eurosceptics was obsessed with the Maastricht Treaty. Mm. They weren't sort of driving towards Britain completely leaving the European Union. And what has been really, really surprising has been the way over the course of the last two decades that the British population moved to a point where 52% voted uh, to, 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 leave the, to leave the EU. There, there was never, as a, you know, there was never really an emotional attachment. But Britain has been a trading nation and a great trading nation for hundreds of years, and the advantages of membership were seen as comfortably outweighing, in economic terms, the political inconvenience of somebody in Brussels designing your sausage for you, as uh, uh, Mr. Johnson famously claimed. Yeah. Okay, well, listen, Colin, thank you very much for that. Thanks for all the panelists. I'm going to hand you, hand you back over to Federico to wrap and up. Thank you very much, Shona. I just want to say some final words uh, to thank the speaker, uh, thank the sponsor, uh, thank the audience, uh, which I'm delighted also included former Tishak uh, Bertie Aaron. Uh, this was the first webinar uh, of the Brexit Institute. I think it was a great success. We had at some point 170 people uh, logging in. Uh, obviously, COVID-19 has been a challenge for us as for uh, anyone else, uh, but trying to see the glass half full, I think the transition to the web uh, has allowed us to actually increase our outreach, as shown in the number of people connecting from uh, really a lot of places uh, around Europe uh, and the world. So I'm happy to anticipate uh, we will have uh, several other webinars in the next few months, uh, and therefore stay connected, both uh, but literally and metaphorically. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank